Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio. So this is going to be a very different show and a conversation that people have been asking a lot about. So I did Veganuary. I narrated my experience on YouTube. Lots of people followed, got picked up by Sky News. It was a very interesting journey because that was all a big surprise. And one of the things that I didn't discuss throughout this whole process was the ethics of a vegan diet. I purposefully wanted to stay away from the argument and from the discussion because for me it's something that generally sits very black and white in people's minds. You either believe that the killing of an animal for food or taking produce from an animal for food or maybe wearing it as well is a, a bad thing. And other people would you know, disagree and that's why some of us are omnivores and some of us are vegetarians or that is part of the argument. And I suppose I needed to be at a point in time where we were ready to have a proper conversation about this because you don't want to muddle it into everything else. I was exploring the vegan diet from a health perspective, from a sustainability perspective, and even as I started to get into the sustainability argument, it became so many layers deep and the data started to confuse itself. And it's, it's like anything, like these conversations really do deserve a good conversation. They aren't a social media post, like that is absolutely ridiculous. Now, one of the things we did do is we, we tried to go out and reach a few people that are prominent in this space. We got a few, yeah, love to come on the show, but when it came to actually sort of organising the interview, it didn't happen. So we're hoping that actually this interview maybe stimulates people to come forward and talk to us about it because me and Tom, Tom's here with me today, um, me and Tom are not gonna sit here and say that this is our opinion. We're gonna give an objective account of how we see it and we're gonna come at it from as many examples as possible, from as many backgrounds as possible. We'll cite some data uh, where we can. Um, but ultimately, you listening to this podcast now today are going to have your own opinions currently. And we're going to try and draw in the opinions of others and the beliefs of others and kind of mix it with what we believe and currently do. One of the things I said throughout the whole of January is I'm not doing this for ethical reasons. I personally, currently, don't see it as an issue with uh, me eating food from animal sources. That's not something um, I believe in. Again, this will, this will come up throughout the show. Um, we're in an echoey room. Uh, me and Tom have uh, crossed paths in the Midlands. So we thought, do you know what? Let's do this podcast together. So Tom, it's probably appropriate that you should say hello. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> thank you for, very much for listening. I apologise if my voice is a little bit more echoey than Ben's. I think I'm a little bit further away from the microphone, but... It's quite a good setting to do this kind of conversation in person because, as Ben says, it's, it's a really complex one. And I think even though when we usually do the podcasts on Skype, we can read each other's faces and things, but you, you lose something when you can literally like prod people. So I think that's quite good. One thing that I do want to say from the outset is to sort of echo what Ben says. This is not us having a definitive position on this issue, although we do both have our current opinions. We are both currently omnivores. I currently eat meat as well. And that means that anything that we do say is going to be tarred. But what I'm really trying not to do here is two things. First of all, I'm not trying to just make tired old arguments about why veganism is not a good idea or why I should be allowed to eat meat. I, I think they're I don't think that's a productive conversation because of what I'm going to discuss later. Um, but also, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anyone when I'm saying any of the stuff that I've got prepared to say. Um, what I'm trying to do here is, I think the most interesting angle of the vegan and non-vegan conversation, from my perspective, is why do people believe what they do believe in relation to this topic? Because if you ask either side, as, as we're going to get into, they both have their reasons and it's not just the case that the vegan individuals are these bleeding heart people that just care about everybody and and want everyone to hold hands and sing kumbaya and it's not the case that everyone that eats meat hasn't thought about these topics at all because while a lot of people might not have a lot of people might have and it's not the case that everybody that eats pigs enjoys looking at videos of pigs being hurt so i think there's there's some sides of this conversation that haven't been discussed and that's kind of what i want to do today so 
started. <laughs> There's so many ways that you can dive into this conversation. It's also important for me, for vegans and anyone that would follow a vegan diet to sit and listen to this conversation objectively as well with an open mind because you have to also understand the beliefs and morals that other people have so that you can have positive conversations. I was at Vegan Life for the weekend and I had a lot of conversations with people that ended up boiling down into the ethical argument. So I was in a nutritional setting at the weekend and I was talking to people about their health and what they believe in and how they're trying to optimize their diet because they believe that you know veganism was, it was an optimal diet. And I started to talk through symptoms and problems that they had, which was actually alarmingly prevalent. I would say 90% of the people that I met at Vegan Life Show, and I probably, I would say confidently spoke to two to 300 people that weekend. They were all suffering with fatigue, low energy, and just didn't feel great. They weren't in a good space. And that's not to say that other people were eating an omnivorous diet and not feeling the same, they are. Um, but it was interesting, when I did Veganuary, I kind of had this emptiness about me. It was like an empty energy, and they kind of, intimated the same it wasn't just a fatigue through lack of sleep and not asking yourself it kind of seemed different and it kind of indicated to me of uh, kind of nutritional deficiencies um you know and they just weren't paying attention at really optimizing their diet uh, and this is where we quite often coin the phrase uh, being a lazy vegan just eating vegan food but really not um optimizing the food that you are eating so if you are vegan listening to this please come into this open-mindedly, listen to our opinions and objectives as well, because then we start to have more productive conversations, because what I don't want it to boil down to, like it did at the weekend with loads of these arguments, is, oh, you believe in killing animals and it's okay and I don't like you anymore, you're not a kind person. But you've got to sit down and ask you know, why that is. Um, it doesn't devalue um, that person and their beliefs and all the other things, uh, or all the other good things that they do in the world. So Tom, trying to navigate this conversation, like where, where do you think we start? Because if I think, I want to maybe draw on an initial, from a nutritional and an evolutionary point of view, in my eyes, we grew up over the years, over the generations, over the centuries to eat meat. We hunted, we killed, we obviously saw that there was nutritional benefit in this. Um, and it's only really now that the world has changed, it's become more civilised, we have to provide for millions and millions and millions of people and produce you know, lots and lots of meat, whereas back in the day we might kill a deer and it lasts like two weeks and we only lived in a little village. So industry has changed, but when I look at it from that perspective, we have gravitated towards this as a food source, surely inherently for a reason. Well, that is an interesting argument, and it's one that most vegans can refute, but I do think it makes, a, it makes a good point. So there's two things that we can look at. There's a historical argument, and then there's an appeal to nature. And what a lot of people who aren't vegan will do is they will appeal to nature. They will say, well, we've always eaten meat, we evolved eating meat, and therefore it's okay to eat meat. And while that is a good argument in terms of health, we evolved to eat meat, um, one of the phrases that's often cited by evolutionary biologists is that we swapped our guts for brains because chimpanzees, gorillas and all of these things, as most people know, they're primarily vegan, although chimps will hunt and kill bonobos without question. Um, a gorilla, for example, will eat kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos of food per day. And although they're just eating fruit and leaves and stuff, that's where they get their protein from because they eat so much of it. However, that means that they have to spend basically all day eating vegetables, otherwise they wouldn't get enough nutrition. And so they've got a massive digestive system in order to deal with that. Human beings throughout our evolutionary history have developed the ability to cook food. And us cooking food enabled us to reduce the size of our digestive tract, and that allowed us to divert some of the energy that we use during development towards our brains instead of our guts. And that is what differentiated us from the apes. So we evolved eating cooked food, and primarily we evolved eating cooked meat because it's a very condensed source of energy, it's where you get a good amount of omega-3 fatty acids, both of which a lot of um, evolutionary biologists believe are important for developing the brains that we've got today. And so it is natural for human beings to eat meat. That doesn't, however, mean that it is moral for human beings to eat meat, because what we've got now is a situation where we don't have to eat meat anymore. People can live and thrive on a vegan diet. And so this is where this argument comes in. It becomes, as we don't have to as we don't have to eat meat now, 
we therefore have to justify it morally because at the end of the day something dies and this is where I think it's interesting because some people will take that to mean okay then we shouldn't kill animals because we can't justify it and yet others will farm cows and pigs for a living for that express purpose and neither of these people are unaware of the ethical arguments for the other side they've just chosen a side and I think that's where unless you disagree with, I want to get your feedback on what I've just said but I think that's where we should probably start where do people get their morals from why are people deciding on one side or the other because as I said we both have the same amount of data well most of the beliefs and values and opinions we have come from our upbringing and our environment so whatever whatever environment we grew up in normalized whatever we believe in so you speak to a pig farmer so i have um you know my wife comes from a family of pig farmers it's totally normal to rear a pig kill it you know eat it across the course of a week it's a great source um of, of food for them uh, it lasts for a long time and they feel that they would bring the pig up in a good, in a humane way and it gets good standards of care Whereas other people that wouldn't grow up in that environment and maybe, you know, for example, my mum became vegetarian uh, at a very young age and we had a lot of vegetarian food in the home when we were younger. And actually, my mum always said, this is my dietary choice. I'm not going to influence this on you. And we actually had, you know, meat in the home. It wasn't as regular as other families. But my mum said, it's my thing and I'm not going to bring my uh, kids up vegetarian. I thought that was quite... Uh, a strong thing to do because the easy thing to do would just be to make the decision for the family home that we would all be vegetarian so it's kind of like we grow up in our environments things become very normal and it's very hard to see the opinions of other people because those opinions have been emotionally formed over years and years of uh, certain education certain behavior certain morals certain values so when I sit across, or sorry, no, when a vegan sits across the table to a pig farmer, a pig farmer is so far away in relatability to where the vegan is because it's just literally what they've known. It's their lifeblood. It's, it's what puts food on the plate for their family. And, you know, we can cite films like Hope and Glory. I remember being uh, sent this film and I watched it. And it's all the worst parts of the meat industry and not for a second of me and Tom going to sit here and justify that, that, that there isn't an issue in the meat industry, that there is plenty of farms, you know, not treating animals in a humane, a humane way. And we want to sit here and say we are all for, you know, animals being reared in a, a safe and humane way, feed, being fed the right diet so the, the meat actually becomes a great quality so that it then passes the nutritional benefits onto us. So it's, it's kind of like yeah, like what is normal for us and then what is normal for our environment um, is, is tough. That's definitely the case. I mean, there, there are two, well, there are, there are a number of schools of thought in terms of morality and, and some of it comes from evolutionary psychology. It makes obvious sense that human beings that live in social circles, that evolved in social groups, that evolved a culture, have certain innate forms of morality. It doesn't matter which culture you go to, killing your brother is frowned upon. Killing your friend is frowned upon. And that's not something that that culture has necessarily learned independently, because every culture does it. It's something that makes an ear sense. You see the same behaviour in a lot of other animal species as well. But just because something is innate and just because something is inbuilt, that doesn't mean that it's not malleable. Because one of the best ways that I've heard this described, I got from um, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, which is that your, your morality, your ethics and your morals are written as a first draft when you're born and then your experience refines that first draft as you go through life. And this is how people who are, two people who are running the same basic hardware, the same basic moral intuitions, will express those basic moral intuitions in very different fashions. So one, two people will sit across from each other, one of them will be vegan, one of them will be an omnivore, and they will both agree that we shouldn't hurt animals unnecessarily. The difference there is along the lines of, well, what is necessary and what is not. And what I would argue is that that is based in innate differences in personality traits, which express themselves in a variety of different behaviors that we will experience day to day and that do differ between people. One of the good ways that I can probably explain this is in terms of the abortion debate. 
two human beings will dramatically differ in their opinion of whether abortion should be legal or whether it should not. And it's not the fact that both of those people have not got access to the arguments that the other side are putting forth, it's that they don't agree with them. And one side you've got, well, the unborn child has got the innate, the innate right to life and therefore it shouldn't be aborted. The other side is, well, it's not a child yet and the mother should be allowed to have bodily autonomy. And there are very good arguments for both sides of that. The one that you agree with is something that is done more through intuition than rationality. And I think that is where I really wanted to take this conversation because we will often think that we can rationalize our moral decisions. We will often think that we, we come to conclusions about, well, should you eat meat, should you not? Okay, justify that. That's a bad argument. And that's the way that these conversations usually go. You shouldn't eat meat. Well, I want to eat meat. Humans have always eaten meat. That's a bad argument. Okay, but the problem there is that that person didn't reach that conclusion because of the premises. It's completely opposite way around. What happens is, with human beings, you are given a moral quandary and your gut intuition will give you what you think about that moral quandary and then you are able to justify that post hoc by using your rationality. This is explained again in the same book, The Righteous Mind. I will be talking about other books as well, I've not just read one book before I did this conversation. Um, but the, the thing that you need to realise is that rationality is not something that we evolved to have in order for us to be able to get to the objective truth of things because having the objective truth isn't evolutionarily um, beneficial. You don't need to objectively know what a rock is made of to know that if you throw it at someone, it'll hurt. You just need to know that the rock is hard stuff, for example. And what that means is that rationality evolved not as a means of delineating objective truth, but of justifying actions, persuading other people, and existing in a social space. So what happens is you will get a gut reaction to something that will be a moral intuition and then you can justify that to other people in order to try and convince them that your moral intuition is correct rather than it being the case that you think rationally and then come to a conclusion that you can then objectively tell the other people is correct. I hope that deline does that delineation sort of mm, make sense? Yeah. So a good way to illustrate this is that a lot of people think that morality is based very simply in harm and fairness. If you hurt something that's bad, if something is unfair, that's bad, and that is all of morality. But it's very easy to come up with situations in which nobody's hurt, in which nothing is unfair, and we will have a good instinct moral intuition that something's wrong, that that's bad, that you shouldn't do that, but it's actually quite difficult to explain why that's the case. And the example I'm gonna give, I'm gonna say up front, it's not nice, so if you are, it, 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 this is, I'm, I'm going to say this to try and shock you. So, should we probably preface this by saying, if you are playing this in the car with your kids, yes. maybe turn it down for a second? Yeah, this is going to take about two minutes. Skip ahead two minutes if, if you don't want to hear it. But So, imagine you've got an individual who is an upstanding member of society. He, he contributes 50% of his wages to charity. He works in a school. He has... A really good standing in all of his social circles everybody really likes him every single social interaction that he has is objectively good and positive and he is a shining light in his community he doesn't have any secrets there is nothing malevolent about him there is nothing wrong with him at all however when he goes home he's got a sex doll that is designed around a four-year-old boy and he has sex with it every night he doesn't have any feelings towards any of the children in the school. He will never interfere with any of the children in the school. It's just purely about this sex doll. Now, if you're like me, I feel a bit sick literally just saying that, but I can objectively say that nobody's hurt. There is no ramifications for anybody else. And it's entirely down to his actions. Nobody else is affected, but I will believe that that is morally wrong. And there might be some people who are listening to this who will say, well, he should be free to do what he wants. and. Yeah, you could probably argue that that's the case, but object, but I have a moral intuition that that is something that is wrong. Would you agree with that? Mm, agreed. Yeah, and that there is your moral intuition highlighting something that has got nothing to do with harm and has got nothing to do with fairness. It's got something to do with purity. And there is an entire conversation that can be had around that, but the important thing there is that you got that moral intuition without having a justification for it. You can probably think of one now, but the intuition came first. And this is where I think the big difference lies 
between people who adopt a vegan diet and people who don't. It's not in the case that they haven't heard enough rational arguments. It's the case that they had the moral intuition in the first place, and then were very easily, very easily able to justify this. Um, I found a very interesting conversation the other day. It was a very short conversation, but a friend of mine is a vegan and she shares a lot of vegan videos about cruelty to animals and things. And one person asked her, just out of curiosity, how many conversions do you actually get from these posts? Because, and he just wrote, because I'll be honest, I just roll my eyes and scroll past. And she said something like, oh, I've had 13 conversions just through writing these posts in the last year or whatever. And they did use the word conversions, but it was him that used it first. And I found that very interesting because that does highlight that some people are more sensitive to these images than others. And I don't believe, personally, that the people that would just roll their eyes and scroll past of the video of the horrible maltreatment of calves or whatever, don't care about that calf. I think they got a moral intuition of, but I like eating meat and I'm fully aware that there are good farms as well. And my moral intuition is that those good farms outnumber the other farms. What they do is okay, and therefore I don't need to pay attention to this video. Whereas some people will get the moral intuition of this is representative of farming in general, and this is bad and I don't like it. And then from those two intuitions, that is where people will start to find themselves in different camps. Mm. Got anything to, anything to say on that before I continue? Yeah, so I've had many conversations with vegans and, uh, you know, the conversation often boils down to them saying, yeah, but you do know a cow died for you to eat that burger. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really, really well aware of how farming works and, and, and that the thing was living before I ate it. And it, like you say, it's not that people don't know that, it's just that their moral compass is absolutely happy with that. And that's why when I watched Hope and Glory, the film, I was really disappointed with the film because all it was is over an hour, it was like an hour and 15 minutes of just all the worst bits of the farming industry, like farmers kicking cows and, you know, being slaughtered in really horrible ways and, you know, just watch, you could see the animals were suffering and I'm not going to, for one minute, like agree with any of that, but it's very easy to highlight the worst bits of any industry and say, look at this horrible person and what they're doing. It's like saying... Um, that you know, and to pick up weird analogies, um, it's like any guy standing by a school fence is a paedophile. It's like, no, there's one or two paedophiles out of, say, a million people that would do and perform that action. And we can stand here and highlight that just that action means that everyone standing by a school de gate is a paedophile. No, nope. there's many people that maybe, like, I, I. I've walked past the school gate and seen school kids playing and actually just stopped and thought, do you know what? I can see loads of happy kids running around, having fun, doing good things. And it was actually just nice to stop for a second and see so many people joyfully just like literally playing and exploring life. And I actually stood there and thought, oh, what it would be like to be a kid again. I wasn't a paedophile. I was literally just having a moment in, in of enjoyment in other people's fun and play it doesn't i, I had zero thoughts towards fucking <laughs> kids or whatever but it, it, it's again it's one of those similar analogies we can we can look at the worst part of any action and say there is loads of really bad people performing this action watch out for anyone performing this action and that's what hope and glory did it's like there's there's a hundred farmers and they've all killed animals in a hundred uh, in horrible ways well the reality is there's another like 20,000 farms killing animals in hum humane ways and you know feeding them the right food and doing all the right kind of things and there's many people that are happy with that process and will and, and this is my perspective with my meat consumption I will try as much as possible it's not always possible like I don't sit in a restaurant and go excuse me sir where is your chicken from and, and there will be people that will do that and that's absolutely fine but 80% of the time, I will try and find you know, meat that is from uh, farms with high welfare standards. I know that I can go to some of my local farmers markets and talk to them about where their meat is from and how they treat their animals and what they've fed it. Because the farms are actually interested in that. Because there is a huge, especially where I live, there's a huge awareness of... Uh, kind of country living and buying from farm shops and engaging in uh, local produce so there's a big awareness so that if I say to the butcher in my local farmer shop 
oh, the pork, where's it from? And they're like, oh, it's from Blytheborough Farms. And they're a, a so-and-so, a certified um, kind of farm. And this is how they kill their animals. And this is the process. And, and that's a great thing. Uh, but the thing is, is, I suppose the reality of modern kind of food production is we've wanted cheaper. And that has forced, you know, factory farming. And I'm not going to say I agree with factory farming. But many industries have had to develop to keep up with food production. And for me, I suppose if I was to try and promote something within food production and animal, uh, animal production, it's like, can we buy better quality food? Can we maybe eat less of it so we can afford better quality food and we can support the industries that are doing the right things with animals? Because I want to, con- I want to keep consuming animal products, but I want to keep consuming high quality, high welfare animal products because I do disagree with some of the practices out there. I do think it is immoral and that is where it would end up sitting on my moral compass. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important thing to put across because one of, like, look, if, if, if someone wants to be vegan, great. I don't, I've never really particularly cared, to be honest. Um, it's none of my business. But I think, and I think most people think the same, but I don't think it's any secret that on social media especially, as soon as someone mentions veganism, the vast majority of social media roll their eyes. And I don't think that's necessarily justified for every person. I've got some good friends who don't eat meat and they're they're great people, they're lovely. But I think there are a few loud voices in more the activist sort of space of veganism that I genuinely think are being counterproductive to the overall aims. And, And this is why, it's not because I find them annoying or anything. I think it's because if you talk to a omnivore who's thought about this, these kinds of things a little bit, they will probably agree with any vegan on 80% of the issues. Um, they don't agree with factory farming. They don't think that animals should be slaughtered in a way that causes unnecessary pain. Um, they don't think that animals should be... Well, for example, in a, in a typical slaughterhouse, what will happen is that the, the cows are not lined up and they can't smell death. What happens is they are kept very separate, they are kept away so they can't see each other being taken to slaughter, they're stunned and then they're killed when they're stunned. And that is done not only to minimise the suffering but because if you have a stressed out animal that mounts a stress response and that affects the texture of the meat. So any good slaughterhouse will seek to minimise that anyway, even if it's only for selfish reasons. Mm. And most people would agree that that is the better way to do things and we shouldn't just process animals in the easiest, quickest way possible, regardless of the amount of suffering that it causes because we want cheaper meat. And I think that message gets lost when there is almost like a purity test of, if you eat animals at all, then you're a bad person and I don't want to talk to you and you should convert to veganism in order to be a good person again. Because I think that allows for the factory farming industry to just stand at the side and watch us fight between ourselves while it continues on with the malpractice that most people would never agree with if they thought about it for two minutes. And I think it would almost be nice to have a sort of cross-party agreement that we should minimise the animal suffering, we should maximise welfare standards, and factory farming is not necessarily a great thing. And then if we have those three agreements, we can start looking at ways forward. And it might mean reducing meat consumption, it might mean a greater awareness of plant-based meal preparation that's affordable for most people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it would mean that we can start to step forward because at the minute, the way I see it, and of, of course, this is just my perspective, I'm sat on the outside. Um, from my perspective, there is a group of people who will jump into every situation that's possible to tell people that eating animals is wrong, and they get responded to by people that write her <laughs> bacon and then we don't get any further forward. Mm. And while all this is going on, factory farming just continues because why would it not? The only people that are opposing factory farming are vegan activists that represent a a very small minority. And if vegan activists could join up with omnivores to go towards a common cause, I think a lot of good could be done. Mm. Just watch out at the table. Yeah, microphone. Um, So, if we're about to have a productive conversation in the future, people need to understand the arguments and the morals and the positions of each each other. And the reason why I want vegans and omnivores and everyone to listen to this podcast is because it's about understanding where we come from, from our upbringings, what perspectives we have, why we have them, because that is going to allow for a productive conversation. At the moment, 
no one's really having productive conversation. The amount of people that I met at Vegan Life where it started off and then as soon as I said, oh, I'm, I'm not a vegan, like they literally just closed off. Like they just weren't interested in talking to me. And I'm like, at no point are you going to help win me over if that's your aim, if you just close off and think I'm a horrible human being for eating animal protein. Like it's just, just not going to happen. And I remember being in the round table discussion that we had in London and I said, Let, let's just hypothesize for a second. When we think of all the problems that we've got in the nutrition industry and solving them, if we ate better quality meat, that means we'd be focusing on probably farms that have got better quality standards, which solves this kind of problem of we don't want to see animals suffering, we want better welfare standards, we want better quality meat. Also, that reduces the impact of factory farming, or sorry, the demand for it. So that means it increases um, the profitability of high quality farms, which means they can grow, which means we can get better quality meat on our table, which is what a lot, what a lot of us want, or we say we want it anyway. So then hopefully that reduces the cost because if we're able to produce more of something, it generally reduces the cost of it. Um, so if we support what we want, then we're going to get that. And then on the secondary side of it, if we start to look at the kind of climate change sustainability argument, which is a factor in this, don't get me wrong. If we're starting to eat more grass fed meat, meat that is being reared in a normal way or a way where we're able to crop rotate we're able to actually support a better farming ecosystem rather than, and you know, this is where there's big problems in the USA, China, South America, where there is massive, massive feedlots and, you know, not much pasture raised meat going on. We're actually supporting an ecosystem, which is where we want to move to. People want to see less impact from the meat industry on things like climate change and stuff. Well, great. If we move towards those, having those dietary choices that we help not solve that problem, but we at least move the needle a little bit. I know that was quite a tangent there. <laughs> it was quite a tangent, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we, to, to kind of bring it back, because at the start of that you said it, it's important for us to understand where everyone's coming from. Um, one thing that I think really gets introduced into this is that people really do differ in temperament. And you see that, I, I mentioned this at the top, but you see that that difference in temperament manifested in a number of different ways. And the best analogy that I can give is that we do have people that sit on left wing of politics and people who sit on the right wing of politics. And the reason that both of those two wings of politics exist is not because you've got the people who are good and the people who have chosen to be on the bad side. It's because we've got two people who differ in temperament to such a degree that they will approach the same issue with the same amount of facts from a completely different angle. And what I think is interesting, um, and of course there will be exceptions to this, but in my experience, the vast majority of people who adopt a vegan lifestyle sit on the left wing of politics. And I think that's very telling because there are some temperamental differences that we can see in the literature that do relate to promoting left wing political positions. And they tend to correlate with something that we can look at in a vegan diet as well. And the only reason that I bring this up is because, again, this is just me further sort of driving home the point that these differences in temperament and not the fact that some people are bad people is what leads to people taking the same thing and, and ending at the different, the different place. So we've got two different axes. There are a number of different axes that people fall upon, but the two that are quite interesting here is uh, in-group versus out-group. It's fairly, it's fairly well known that human beings are in-group, out-group animals. We, we like the people who agree with us and we dislike the people who don't. Yep. You, can, you can find that in anything. You can find that in what football team you support, what country you come from. We identify ourselves by our groups. And the group identity that you adopt becomes something that you will defend. And what we tend to find on the left wing of politics is that it is, well, it, the left wing is the politics, supposedly, of inclusion. The left wing is the politics that supposedly uh, get, wants rid of racism, wants rid of homophobia, wants rid of etc. etc. And what that is at bottom is an increase in the magnitude of the in-group. That's including more and more and more and more people in the in-group. And what I see often in the rhetoric of people who are trying to convince people to become vegan is a further widening of the in-group to include non-human beings, so animals. This is where we see 
uh, the language of uh, a cow. When a cow gives birth to a calf, the calf is usually removed to be taken away somewhere else. And the language is then changed to a baby has been taken away from a mother. And that is a reflection of the increase in magnitude of the in-group. The problem with that is you can't completely increase the magnitude of the in-group to encompass literally everybody because then that becomes counterproductive. And that is why some people evolved to have the temperament, which is the opposite, to further decrease and decrease and decrease the in-group because the extremes of both ends become problematic. And so the idea is that in a socially evolved species, those two competing factions would continually converse with each other and they would almost put a stop on either one of them getting the hegemony. And at that point, we have a balance. And at the minute, most, mostly in the West, for example, that mostly works. It's not perfect, but it works. And the same thing happens with in-group, out-group. I'm not trying to make a point there other than that in-group, out-group perspective is what probably leads to some people having the moral intuition that killing animals is wrong and some people not having that. And the other side of it is whether you view things through the lens of liberty or oppression. If you view the world through the lens of liberty, when you look at the animal killing is it right argument, what you see is, well, I'm a human being and therefore I am, I suppose, able to eat this animal and therefore why should I not? And if you view the world through the lens of oppression, you say, well, you are in, in a sense above this animal and therefore you should not oppress it just because you can. And I think those two axes are they're the primary two, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. They're the primary two that I can isolate. Do you consider animals to be part of your in-group? And do you consider the killing out of animals to be the expression of your liberty to do so, provided you make sure that welfare and everything is in place? Or do you see it as a symbol of oppression? And I think the answer that you have to that is more innate than learned. Mm. So sticking to the former part of that, if if we look at how we classify our in-group, surely that then comes again down to environment, exposure, your upbringing. So if we, there's a big argument in the vegan community about uh, what is a you know, sentient being. And if we start to say, okay, so what is in the in-group? Okay, so what consciousness of what's going on does a cow have compared to a pig have, compared to a cat, compared to a dog, compared to a rat, compared to a mouse, compared to a vowel, compared to a fly, compared to a, like, where does that thing stop? Because if we become completely inclusive, it's like, okay, so when a mosquito lands in my arm, am I allowed to kill it? And it, I know that's an extreme example, but at some point, everyone has their, oh no, I'm not eating a cat, that's a bit fucking weird. But in China, they probably happily clean up a cat and put it into their chow mein. So it's, for me, that then becomes a very difficult argument because in China it's normal, in the UK it's not, and I'm sure there's many other cultures where you know very what we would consider weird animals are eaten. Mm, definitely, oh, absolutely. I mean, if you go on to mainland Europe, a lot of people eat horses. A lot of the UK would find the eating horse to be abhorrent because they don't view horses as food animals, and that's definitely something that's culturally learned. Absolutely. Mm. Um, my dad lives in China. And the culture around dog ownership has changed a lot in the last generation. And now most people would, wouldn't even think of eating a dog. There's now like dog rights. You get dog shelters and things, whereas before dogs were on the menu, like we're talking 20 years ago. And so there's definitely a learned part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, we're, so we've got to kind of navigate our way out of this conversation. Um, I'm not going to say that we're going to have kind of like a finale point to this podcast because like we've hi highlighted so much of this argument is subjective. Like I suppose, Tom, how do, you, how do you personally feel about the ethical argument of veganism? I would sit here and personally say that I'm very happy to consume animal products for food. I believe I've evolved to eat it. I eat it and I say... My body says to me, I feel this is a healthy thing to do. I feel strong on it. When I did a vegan diet, 
I didn't feel strong. I felt there was something constantly missing in my diet. So for me to include well-reared, healthy, occasional animal proteins, and I will say occasional because since January, I've probably cut my meat intake by a good 60%. It's been relatively significant, and I probably only eat meat usually for like my evening meal now. Last night I didn't eat it, the night before I did, the night before that I didn't. So it is, it is become quite occasional. But when I weigh up the health component, the quality component, the sustainability component, I've kind of navigated myself to this place where I'm happy to eat animals, but I want it to be high quality, but I also want real nutrient density and variety because I do believe that nutritionally, there is massive benefits to animal protein. Oh yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think my position is relatively similar to yours, apart from I think I'm, I probably eat meat a little bit more than occasionally. And I think the way that I view it is very similar in that provided the animal has got good welfare during the time that it's alive, I don't think it's immoral for us to eat it. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I can go into to end the podcast, I think. Because I think the first yeah. one is... We, a lot of the time when this point comes up, well, if the animal's well looked after, then it's okay. And then the counter argument to that is, well, whether it's well looked after or not, the fact is that something has to die for you to have, your, for you to have it on your plate. And so we need to ascertain whether the reason that you oppose eating meat is because something dies or because something suffers. And there's a short thought experiment that you can do to find that out. The first one is, well, would you eat lab grown meat? Would you eat meat that has never been alive, it never will be alive, it's just literally a chicken breast that grew on a shelf? Would you eat that? And if you would, then your quandary is not with things, your, your problem is not with eating meat, it's with eating meat that used to be part of an animal. Then you can think, and my answer to that is no, I would have no problem with eating lab-grown meat. Then the, the next thing is, well, okay, so what if it wasn't a chicken breast that grew on the shelf? What if we could find out a way to genetically modify chickens and grow them like carrots? So you plant a chicken seed and a whole chicken emerges, but the only difference is it doesn't have a nervous system. It's completely unable to be conscious. It is completely unable to experience pain. It is completely unable to experience wants, desires, fears, anything. The only difference between this and the chicken breast that grew on a shelf is that it's got feathers on it and it's got legs. And for me, the answer there is no, I wouldn't have a problem eating that. And what that does is that takes away, well, you don't have a problem eating meat, the problem is that the meat was part of an animal. Okay, what if the animal doesn't experience pain at all? And if you don't have a problem with that, then your problem is with unnecessary suffering and not with eating animals. But you could then say, well, that chicken was never alive. You grew it like a carrot. So the last one is, well, okay, what if you've got a pig? And that pig has got the same amount of sentience as a human being. It's completely alive, it can talk, it can think, it's got dreams, it's got wants, it's got wishes. But its wants and its wishes are to be eaten. The thing that would give this pig the most pleasure in the world, the thing that, the thing that it absolutely lives for, is because it really, really wants you to stun it, humanely slaughter it, and roast it and cook it for your dinner. Would you eat it? And if you would, then that's fine. If you wouldn't, then that tells you that your problem is with killing animals. If, you've got, if you came up with any other answer, like, oh, well, if it's what the pig wants to do, if it's what the pig wants to do, then your problem is not with killing animals. Your problem is with killing animals that don't want to be killed. And the idea there is that the animal doesn't want to be killed because if it was still alive, it would have had a good life if you'd left it alone. Does that make sense? Mm. So, okay. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, is it possible for an animal to have a better life if it's destined to be on your plate than if that wasn't the case? And I would say that it is, for two reasons. First of all, if a cow was never born on a farm, it probably would never be born at all. And so if that animal does have a good life on the farm, then it had a better life than it otherwise would have because it wouldn't have existed in the first place. So it's getting two, three, four, five years of good life, living, eating nice grass, meeting other nice cows, and doing all of the things that cows enjoy doing, it wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that if it was never born on the farm. The next step is, well, okay, what about animals that live in the wild? So this cow, instead of being born on the farm and destined to be, to be on your plate, what if you bred cows and then just set them free and left them alone? Well, nobody gets out alive. That cow is then gonna have to deal with predators. It's gonna have to deal with 
uh, different climates. If you ever watch planet Earth, the animals do not have a nice life. Mm. And then they all eventually either die of being too old and so they can't run fast enough and so a predator takes them down and eats them while they're still alive. Or Pretty they, traumatic. Or they, or they starve to death or they might put their leg down a mole hole, mm. snap its leg and then it starves to death in the middle of the field. And so realistically, on balance, pragmatically, if the animal is brought, born into a farm where the farmer takes care of it, gives it its vaccinations, makes sure that it's always looked after by the vet, has a fantastic life, it's looked after, it's protected from predators, it's always got enough food, it can breed whenever it needs to breed, and then at the end of its life, it's stunned so it doesn't feel anything, and then it's instant, that cow has had a better life and it had a better death than it would have done if humans hadn't intervened. And in my opinion, that ethically justifies the consumption of meat from farms that have high, high animal welfare standards. Uh, Thomas, um, I think that was a little bit of a mic drop finish. Um, no, like honestly, it's a brilliant summary because when you, when you add that much context, it allows people to really define where they sit. And what we want is, again, for people to have productive conversations. So because we've added so much width to this podcast, when things come up online, hopefully omnivores like us and vegans, um, like people that might be listening, can actually engage in a conversation where they have enough context to have a humane conversation. And it doesn't just go, oh my God, you're an asshole because you eat animals. Have you no kind of um, sympathy for their suffering and blah, blah, blah. But when you've just listened to you know, some of Tom's um, examples there, his thought experiments, that person who's an omnivore can then say, well, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? And actually, now we, we don't end up at a different end point because the chances are those moral beliefs will still exist. The vegan will still believe what they believe. The omnivore will st still believe what they believe and they will probably still do the same thing. But at least they've engaged in a meaningful conversation that hasn't um, ended in that person those two people just kind of hating each other. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to support one side or the other. Me and Tom are trying to sort of state our position, add a load more context, and actually make sure that there isn't just this massive rift between these two sides, um, because it's not conductive for anything. Absolutely, I mean, of course, I have just... <laughs> Not to disagree, but I, I have just essentially stated my case, like I have mm. just supported my position. And so, as I said at the start, this is not me trying to convince anyone. I think this is me more trying to put into the conversation the other side, because generally what I see online is the very simplistic, killing animals is wrong, to eat meat you have to kill animals, therefore eating meat is wrong. And then there's no productive argument comes from the other side because the people who have the moral intuition of eating animals is okay don't tend to have they don't tend to have productive arguments and I would say that the the meat eating side are just as if not more responsible for the breakdown in conversation between the two what could be considered opposing factions as as the vegan side does and what I'd, what I'd love to come out of this podcast is for people to comment share let us know what they think and if there's someone who would like to come on and put forward the other side in a more coherent way than the simplistic vegan argument that I just presented then that would be brilliant I, I would love to hear that argument I would love to hear the other side because I think it's something that really does need to be elucidated fully rather than just in YouTube comment sections. 100% mm, we are more than happy to have a part two of this so if you feel there's someone that could really add depth to this conversation um, then invite them on. We would want someone that would be articulate in their views, would be compassionate to our current views and stance so that, again, we can have a productive conversation and it doesn't just end up in um, a real rabbit hole debate where we're just sticking our heads out and throwing hand grenades over at each other because, it, again, it doesn't lead anywhere. Um, if you have seen this on social media and you want to share it around, please do give it a share. Um, it's a really important conversation and I'm really hoping that this adds a lot of context to people that wanted more context. It was like the number one thing that was left for me to discuss um, 
on uh, this whole kind of vegan um, situation uh, of media and veganuary and stuff. So hopefully this has kind of wrapped things up. I haven't really got anything more to add without jumping down kind of different rabbit holes. Uh, so we'll keep this podcast as concise as possible. Um, if you want to learn more about, you know, just nutrition education in general, please do remember that we run the VTN Academy and it is a nutrition objective a nutrition education company that focuses on uh, evidence-based nutrition but taught in a practical way because ultimately, again, it's like this conversation, if we can't present the argument, if we can't present the context, if we can't add width to this, then there's no point in just learning this information. Um, we're running a conference uh, in April. If you want to come along, reach out, get details. It's in uh, Stansted. Uh, Bishop Storford it's on the 13th of April me Tom will be speaking and five other practitioners practitioners that used to be uh, in our in our education system so they're you know real people helping other real people with real problems anyway that's enough from us today I hope you've enjoyed this conversation please do share please do give us your comment um, like again if you want to add more layers to this argument then absolutely do it not argument conversation is a conversation please do do it whether it's via private whether it's on social media we absolutely don't mind um anything else to add tom no i think that's everything awesome well thank you very much for being amazing listeners uh, again please do share your thoughts otherwise all that is left for you to do is go and have an awesome day goodbye